to be a woman in Brazil is dangerous and it hurts. Only in 2020, one woman was a victim of femicide every seven hours. We are not a homogeneous group and therefore our struggles have differences. But being a woman in Brazil, it is to understand that no one else will fight for our Would right you to be self-sufficient. Let's see. Our yes, voices I want the two are here when there is the echo here. of okay, thousands of that others that. along with it. If I was the leader of Brazil, I would guarantee women public policy is necessary to ensure quality education, health care and social justice. When I talk about guaranteeing education, it goes far beyond reading and writing. It is in the sense of giving voice, empowerment and self-worth. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the last panel of the day. It's been an incredible two days for those of you who actually have sat through two days' worth. It has been enlightening. I've been going to women's forums for 16 years, so uh, it makes me, I suppose, a veteran here. And I'm feeling very hopeful and positive because we've made some major strides. And one of the places that we need to do even more uh, strides is uh, sustainable finance. So we are seeing a huge interest among uh, women and men, especially millennials, in uh, sustainable and ethical finance. And this is something that I've been teaching for 16 years, uh, business human rights and corporate sustainability. Every year I have been, I have 80% of my students are women. Why is that? They are really interested in these issues. And now, there's even a role for them in finance, which we didn't expect. So we are going to be looking at some of these issues. We have an extraordinary, very diverse panel. Very happy to have a male CEO here, and we're putting him sort of front and center, um, because we are, uh, if you didn't have that many women in your company, you wouldn't be here. <laughs> because clearly, they said, this is something that you need to do. So thank you for listening to them, because the first thing to do is to listen to the women. That's always good advice. So uh, a, couple of just, uh, a couple of statistics, because I think it's important to understand how important it is, why we need more women investors in sustainable finance. We already are attracting more, uh, a lot, but we need to grow it because women have been making a lot of financial decisions for the family um, and what's best for their children and their, their, the, the larger family, but uh, they're starting to align their investments with their values, what they feel is best for community, their neighbors, and most importantly, the planet. And uh, according to the US Sustainable Investment Forum, there's some interesting statistics, $17 trillion um, are being invested responsibly um, in the U.S. in 2020. So responsible investments have grown in the last two years by 42% to 17 trillion. That's with a T, yeah. okay? That's a lot. <laughs> and uh, I gave the statistic in a few panels ago. Nearly half of the primary breadwinners in the household in the United States will be women by 2030. So actually, that's very significant. And um, just, we, we're going to be talking about a lot of these um, very interesting issues, but I'd like to, in, to focus on how we're gonna increase these women in sustainable finance. So we want more women investors, because we need to turbocharge the shift into investment. What is the role of banks? And we have a fantastic woman, Paribas, who is going to be telling us about the role of banks in changing this shift. What is the role of companies? 
And we have two extraordinary representatives from companies. And then, of course, what is needed from our, our po policy and the, the inter international financial institutions, because they have a huge role, too. And we haven't been talking. We did talk about the EIB last, uh, yesterday, but we need to talk about the role of financial institutions. So um, without further ado, what I'm going to gonna have is um, I'm going to have Elena Goitini introduce what Paribas has been doing in terms of sustainable finance. I have to say, from what I'm seeing from the United States, I am so impressed because this bank really has made strides. They are not only talking the talk, they are really walking the walk. And so, um, Elena, please tell us how you are really engaging. What is the what is, first of all, what is the role of the bank doing this? Is this a role that banks should have? And if so, how are you planning to engage and educate? Okay, thanks, uh, thanks Nina for this introduction. Uh, it's true that uh, sustainability uh, is really part of the core business of Bempe Paribas. Uh, being uh, the bank uh, for a changing world means uh, for us uh, to be the bank committed to uh, changing the world for a better future. And, uh, and this is something that is part of the strategy. And this is, in my opinion, the real way we need to, to deal with uh, sustainability. Meaning that it has not to be an, an additional uh, layer, something on top of strategic uh, uh, matters. We need really to embed it into the uh, corporate uh, strategy. And in doing that, uh, we need really uh, to, to do three things, in my opinion. And these are the things we are doing uh, at BNP Paribas level. Uh, the first one is really uh, to share an ESG internal culture. Mm -hmm. And how to translate it in ESG internal culture in concrete terms, uh, it means really to use sustainability as a lens through which you assess daily business, daily decisions, and so on. The second uh, step you need to, 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 to put in place is really to promote ESG values across your customers. Uh, when I think at the bank role, I do think it's crucial uh, for two reasons. Because we need, uh, for sure, to work on our own corporate right. strategy. But the most important, we need to accompany clients in developing uh, uh, their strategy and in faster accelerating uh, their transition. In doing that, uh, promoting ESG values across customer means uh, to uh, answer to their financial needs, but also use some gentle nudges in order to push them uh, in the transition, in order to fast, in order to accelerate. There is a last uh, um, part that is, in my opinion, very, very important, that is more traditional, let's say, and it is to develop uh, ESG-oriented products and services. This is true for wealth managers, for uh, actors in capital market, for example, but also for retail bank as well. Having this three-step uh, approach uh, will, uh, will put us in, in a way to have a sort of comprehensive strategy that uh, will, uh, com will uh, put the sustainability at work in a very concrete way, I would say. Thank you, and I think I, I, I see every day what, what Paribas is doing, so it's really extraordinary. Uh, for those who may not be into the ling lingo, I, I should have explained what ESG is, because that is an investment lens using environment, that's the E. S is social, which I actually hate this word, but it's human rights risks, and that means also lack of gender in the company, which uh, uh, our CEO is doing an amazing job with. Um, and then governance, which has always been the basis of most investment decisions in classic mainstream investing up until now. Obviously, if uh, the governance of the company is corrupt, you don't want to be anywhere near it. But the E and the S, especially during COVID, has really come to the fore. Yeah. And I think we've seen how important it is for human capital, right? So, um, so uh, Paribas is doing extraordinary work also in terms of Share, uh, uh, the shareholder advocacy um, in the United States. We are a little bit behind in the US. Um, so thanks to Paribas, they're showing the way and the American banks are, are having to catch up. Yeah. So I'm appreciating that a lot. Um, I wanted to uh, ask uh, Odile, who is our new, the new president of the EVRD, 
So this is a fantastic uh, um, first time that you are at the Women's Forum, correct? Yes. And uh, welcome. And wondering what you see is the, the, the role of the EBRD in sort of helping shepherd this. Um, you've got the private banks that are working quite hard. We're hoping there's a race to the top here. How can you help? No, so we, we, we are a development bank, so we have public shareholders and uh, intervening in countries, uh, emerging countries, uh, right. or developing countries, mostly East, I mean, Eastern European countries, but also um, Central Asia, North Africa, Western Balkans, and so forth. So a diversity of countries with also a lot of different backgrounds, different cultural approach, and so forth. And what we are doing, we, we believe um, that the gender issue is extremely important for economic growth, for sustainable development, for also, I mean, human rights and um, ethical issues. And what we are trying to do is in our activity, in all its dimension, to support this agenda. So for us, first of all, as an institution, and I think when I was looking back in the bank management 10 years ago, no woman in the XCOM. So it's a top management level, no women. So this has been progressing a lot. Now we are almost half. Um, yeah. Yeah. But then also in the work we do with um, the countries we support. And basically, this, there is two dimensions. The first one is using our financial instruments and financial uh, I mean, loan uh, activity to bring in dimension of um, gender uh, equality of opportunities and so forth. So for example, when we are lending to a company in transportation or in energy, we are discussing whether what is the state, state of play in gender, I mean, in the company, mm -hmm. and bringing some additional conditions to, grant, to expand the loan so that the company developed, for example, um, um, I mean, trade, training for women, skill, rebalancing, uh, management, um, uh, structure, or things like that. So this is something we are really, with our, all our clients, talking about this dimension and trying to find appropriate action that would bring further um, activity in favor of women. For the banking sector, for example, we have also facilities targeted for women in business. So where we provide guarantees to support banking activity or banking loan for devoted to women. The other very important dimension is talking with the authorities. And um, in a number of countries, and sometimes it's amazing, I was, I was in Kazakhstan um, 10 days ago, two weeks ago, and I re we realized that in Kazakhstan you have 100 professions which are forbidden for women. They are not allowed to... Hmm. to in I, where? Kazakhstan. 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 100. Yeah. 100. So it's quite okay. large. <laughs> so in banking. Quite, not in banking. No, no, not in banking. There, but you know. but <laughs> in, you know, <laughs> truck driving, I don't know, construct, building, uh, building houses and so forth. And so part of the policy reform mm -hmm. we promote in the country is to open up all profession mm -hmm. for women. So we have, we have developed a strategy um, which covers all the kind of um, activity and ways we can promote um, the gender agenda in all the countries in which we intervene. For example, in, and we, we also link now with another priority which have, we have, which is green. Yeah. So, because women would be probably in a number of countries the most, I mean, the strongest victim of climate change, yes. the most affected by climate change, as they have been the most affected by COVID. And, um, and therefore, we really believe that they can be also very important players in dealing with climate change. So um, that's why, for example, we have some, there are also specific facilities for green cities or um, green facilities for banking, and they're also including a, woman, a, a dimension for uh, gender balance or training specifically women to be active in climate change. For example, we have a program of, um, uh, in Morocco for uh, water management and skilling specifically women working in agriculture in order to ensure that they can, um, I mean, they are trained for water management in so, the context of climate. So if they want the money, yeah, they need, <laughs> they they need to the act money, on that. They need to do the training and exactly. they need to yeah. change the policies. Exactly. Uh, exactly. Money talks, okay, so that's a way to do it. <laughs> um, but again, without, without uh, a lot of women and men 
um, also are lacking the, the know-how, right? Mm -hmm. And so I wanted to, uh, to talk to our uh, expert at the Bank of Italy, Alessandro Pizzicelli, because I know that um, the Bank of Italy has been doing so much on financial literacy, which is one of the big issues. Uh, because how can women sort of go into finance or g get involved in any way if they really don't have the skills? So can you talk to us about the extraordinary work that's being done? Well, thank you so much for having me here today. I, uh, uh, the issue of financial literacy, it's important from many different perspectives. Of course. Yeah. Um, first of all, let me tell you one thing. Uh, women know a lot about they just lack the self-confidence of using their knowledge to move forward, to make investments for themselves or for their families. And in the number of studies that we have been doing at Banca d'Italia, we have seen that women, most of the times, when they invest money, they do it for the good of the family, not only their own. So in that sense, they also are promoting growth at a larger level they're promoting the establishment of their family, the studying of their children. So they are extremely interesting and good investors. Now, uh, financial literacy is coupled with digital literacy because of the way in which industry is going and so everything is moving on platforms. And so we do need to have um, more women able to make those choices by themselves. Um, about a year and a half ago, most, yes, about a year and a half, half ago, we have created a specific department in the Banca d'Italia that looks after um, consumer protection and financial mm -hmm. literacy. And uh, we've been working on a number of different levels. We have been working with teachers because we want to get these issues as part of the curricula for children because you've got to start at the very beginning. We have worked together with a number of organizations in order to address the issue of poverty and financial literacy that touches women and has been touching women particularly now with the pandemic because we have seen the divide you know, that has increased, more women have lost jobs, more women have got, became poor, poorer. And also we are now uh, working together um, with, within a specific program that is going to uh, put together digital and, and financial. Um, when a woman is capable of making those choices, she is also a better citizen. She participates more to the, the life of our democracy. She's capable of moving forward and moving her tribe forward. So this is a very uh, pivotal issue, an extremely important um, a theme that I see it as the base for a lot of that we can do in terms of the industry, in terms of growth, in terms of getting more women into work. Because of course, when you know and understand the importance that all of this has, you do have a better capacity to understand exactly what you're getting into. Say, negotiating for <clears throat> equal pay, you need to know exactly what that means in terms of then accruing you know, that difference over the years. If you start with a lower salary, you're going to end up with lower pension rights. Right. Well, financial literacy, that's an important takeaway. And I'm hoping that um, in the, the G20 sort of roundup, yeah. that is really a pillar. Because it all, it all comes from, it all starts there, for men and for women, right? Mm. Boys and girls, let's say. Uh, but then there's that interesting element, and I'm going to turn to our two our, our, our wonderful company representatives, and I'll start with uh, Marco Alvara here, because if there are, and I, I, I think that more women, and, and there is literature, there's quite a bit of literature on this, that more women invest, more women are interested in investing in the in environmental and human rights issues or companies that are actually showing leadership like yours on human rights and environmental issues are the kinds of long-term investors that you want to attract. And so the more women we can get as investors who then have to review your company profile and, and look at what you are doing, 
those are the kinds of women that may say, okay, I'll take Znam over another company because I believe in a company that cares about climate change and is helping, is thinking seriously about that transition to a greener economy, that is thinking seriously about gender issues, that is ser thinking seriously about a whole bunch of things. So I, I was wondering whether you could comment on that as, um, as our, our male representative here from a company, no pressure, but you have really surrounded yourself by some amazing women. So these are these are these are two separate issues, right? So yeah. let's maybe we talk later about about SNAM and what we're doing in SNAM. I would sure. I would I would focus on uh, your point about ESG first. I would say that, and I, I've been uh, uh, let's say touring the investor community for now 15 years, and I've always seen the best where there's no gender bias. So like in the UK, it's a good example. The best portfolio managers have often been women, and, mm -hmm. and there's a, a huge uh, percentage, uh, almost bias in favor of women when it comes to real meritocracy on, on the portfolio management. And I relate that in, in my home, it was always my grandmother mm -hmm. uh, managing managing the assets because mm -hmm. she 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 was cooler about selling at the right time, and <laughs> and she had more of a sense of purpose. But model, but really, right? it's it's really about mm -hmm. the, having a purpose. And I think something that I've found. Um, and, and which is very applicable uh, to uh, making uh, diversity happen inside the company, is that I think guys and boys tend to pack more together and, and feel more of a peer pressure when it comes to certain trends. And so in some companies, and some of the companies I look at and I, some of the CEOs I talk to, they're like almost saying, you know, why are you doing that? You know, why are you pushing the ESG, ESG agenda so hard? Uh, you know, what's in it for you? There's mm. almost a, you know, a little no bit question. more of a consensus uh, seeking, yeah. but it's yeah. true. And and I think part of that was coming out of America. And what I'm really excited about, Gina, is really the the uh, ESG weight is increasing in America, and the business roundtable is now endorsing ESG. And so it's kind of coming back in Italy here. We've always had ESG at the center of a number of corporate initiatives. We've had Enrico Mattei, we've had Adriano Olivetti, we've always had kind of progressive companies. A lot of the companies here are held by the government or families, so a lot more kind of longer term orientation than the kind of the quarterly pressure some of my US colleagues are for. So coming to ESG investing, I think almost 40% of our institutional investors are ESG. You talked about $17 trillion of ESG money in the States. If you look globally, there's $70 trillion of sustainability investment. And when we're talking about sustainability, no one really knew what it means. So, so I think we're very fortunate now to have a, a kind of a nomenclature. ESG is going to become much more scientific. Yeah, final, yeah. On the E, it's very clear we have to get to zero, and there's no question about that eventually. On the G, as you mentioned, Gina, we're very clear also. It's always been around. There's a lot of literature on the G. S is where it's uh, a little less certain, mm -hmm. and so that's where we are working on at SNAM and, and with Patrizia and Sofia and and Carolina, who are here, we're launching the, with other companies a world well-being movement. We really need to measure the S. And I see this with my hat yeah. as a board member of S&P Global. I'm, I'm head of the finance committee there. Very soon, ESG ratings are going to be almost as important as, as corporate debt ratings. And you're going to have companies measured on their ESG score even more than, than maybe their, their bottom line because of that 70 trillion. Yeah with more women hmm. in, in charge, uh, really leading where the money's going to. So we're doing quite well. We're on in all the ESG indices so far, touching wood, we're doing quite Borsa well. Borsa Italiana, just now. On, on the Borsa Index, on the Bloomberg Index, yeah. on the F FTSE MIB, uh, on a number, on the FTSE for Good, and all these indices. But what's really good about it is, before we used to just have sustainability reports, now we have very precise models that trickle, in, and we have our chairman of our remuneration committee here in the room as well. Uh, this is a key part of our remuneration. So a woman. A woman. Yeah, I mean, She's I, I haven't met very many men at SNAM. <laughs> I'll have to go and, and check it out. But these women are extraordinary. <laughs> I wanted to add something to something that you just said um, that we don't talk about very much. There's a, there's a, a generational transfer of wealth uh, happening right now in the next decade of the sort of the, the the 1% baby boomers 
and the, the millennials who are taking on the reins. And they, they estimate that's almost $40 trillion of wealth going to these millennials. And they have very different, they have very different purpose questions. Driven. And very purpose driven, very much climate change driven, very much on this uh, diversity and inclusion, all these issues. And this is gonna change the equation, I think. But let's talk about a tougher country. Um, so the, we have uh, Noura from the uh, Emirates and the United Arab Emirates. I know the women have really been uh, very central uh, to uh, the economy in the last few years. 40% of the women in public sector are women, correct? More or less. Uh, yeah. More or less. And then, and then they, have, they have you at the, uh, the oil company. Um, so tell me, how, what does sustainability look like at an oil company in, in uh, the Emirates? And how are you going to make the difference? Thank you, Nina. An easy Sorry. question. <laughs> Let's start with so first, I would like to thank Kiara for the invitation. I feel very honored and privileged to be here, actually, with you, everyone here. And uh, to start with, I'll just give like a little bit of picture about the country itself and what we are doing and how this is actually cascaded down. So it's literally like two approaches, top down, bottom up. Bottom up. So at the United Arab Emirates, sustainability has been at the core of our strategy, at the core of our attention since its establishment in the 1971. And uh, I mean, many initiatives have been done, but the most recent one is our announcement and of our commitment towards net zero. That happened literally like uh, you, you, few you weeks made ago. an announcement of net zero? Yeah. When? A yeah. uh, couple of weeks ago, like. A couple of weeks ago. Well, that's, 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 ser that's just serious very, stuff. very recent, actually. Okay. Congratulations. Yeah. Thank you so much. And uh, that's coming from the country leadership. Mm -hmm. And then when, when you look at companies, I mean, uh, Abu Dhabi National Oil Company is an oil and gas company. So following, let's say, the leadership of our country, following, let's say, the movement of the whole world actually towards that, we have actually pledged our commitment as well to, to decrease our greenhouse gas emissions by 25% by 2030. And we are focusing to increase our capacities in the carbon capture, utilization, and storage to a significant uh, mm -hmm. extent. So this is like in the sustainability, let's say, towards environment. When we look at the social, we have like created at Abu Dhabi National Oil Company multiple initiatives that focuses on the social aspect. One of them is something that we call in-country value. And this is a program that started in 2018 at ADNOC. And this is like mainly supporting the private uh, sector in the UAE, looking mm -hmm. at local uh, suppliers, enhancing and stimulating the economy internally. And just recently, the this uh, program started being launched at the country level as well. And uh, with a recent announcement from the Ministry of Industry and Advanced Technology, they started the, launching it, let's say, at the countrywide. So this is being sponsored from ministers now. So that's on that aspect. When it comes to females... Yeah, let's talk about yeah, the women. That's actually, that's a very, very, let's say, my favorite subject. That's why I kept it towards, let's say, the, the last. So just like what Her Excellency Noura Kaabi said this morning, she mentioned about that women empowerment has been at the focus of the country since the 1970s. And that was led, again, from the leadership. Sheikh Fatma, uh, Her Highness Sheikh Fatma started that in 1975. So for, for years, the, the, the UA has supported the females, ensured that they are empowered, ensured that they have the right resources and the support and the ecosystem. So from that, we can, you can see we have female ministers, we have female CEOs, we have global ambassadors. That's at the country level. If you look at Abu Dhabi National Oil Company, same thing. We have female CEOs, we have female CFOs. We have uh, board members, uh, females as well. How many? 23. 23. Out of how many? Uh, I don't have the total, but from the 16 companies in Adnan Group, we have 23 female representatives. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, we have a gender balance committee as well. I'll talk about the details. Gender when balance as committee as well. in the, in the Emirati Emirati Oil Company? Yes, that's in Abu Dhabi National Oil okay. Company. And this gender balance committee is headed by a female as well. Okay. <laughs> So things are changing. Yep. Things yeah. are changing quietly, but they're changing. <laughs> they are, they are. Yeah. But what you're saying, and this is something that we, we heard from um, Marco Alvara, it, it really has to come from the top. Definitely. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Because bottom up is very difficult. And you need, and, and I'm sure Paribas has got that same thing happening. You have to have that committee. That, that, yeah. Uh, that yeah. I do think impulse. that we need both. Yeah. Of bottom course. up and top down. Yeah. 
uh, because we need for sure a role model in terms of uh, uh, deploying the, uh, the uh, top-down approach mm -hmm. through role models. These are keys. And then uh, I guess that we need uh, really, I, I do think that in order to turn uh, diversity into inclusion, you, you need also the strength from the bottom-up approach, meaning communities uh, and uh, really mixing the two, the two strengths. The stakeholders. Yeah. So we were having a little conversation behind uh, in the green room about whether uh, women went into ESG because it yeah. was sort of an open vacuum in, um, in mainstream investing, or whether they went in because they really believed that uh, their, their purpose was really to go into uh, investing with an environmental um, and a human rights uh, lens. And uh, so there, we just wanted to sort of go around here and ask what you, what you think. I'll start with you, Elena, and then I'll, I'll ask all of you yeah. uh, whether, you know. Um, but yeah, 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 we need to say that, uh, that now uh, sustainability uh, now is, is really a central discipline. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The, but it, until recently, uh, I, I, I would say that ESG uh, played a sort of Cinderella role in the uh, <laughs> financial system. Um, to, uh, there was too marginal, uh, lack of visibility, uh, limited uh, uh, resources, uh, uh, may uh, have discouraged those looking for fast careers, either men or, or women, um, from investing in ESG. Today is a bit different. Uh, according to data, uh, we can see that uh, more than 45% of uh, the key position in ESG uh, are held by women. Uh, in worldwide or? or worldwide. This and is this huge, is, yeah. 45%. Yeah, 45. It, it's more, more, almost uh, the double uh, looking at managerial position as a, as a whole. So it means uh, a, a very good starting point. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is for sure a positive aspect, but there is also a dark side of the medal in my opinion. Uh, because, uh, mm, and you, you, you are mentioning why uh, women were chosen ESG. Strong beliefs, for sure, this is a very good aspect. But sometimes, in my opinion, they were chosen ESG because they were perceiving it more user friendly, less risky compared mm. to the traditional finance. And this is something that we have to have clear in mind in order to investigate the root causes because, and this is linked to the self-confidence mentioned by uh, uh, Alessandra Perazzelli just a few minutes ago. We need really to look at the root causes and to cover the gap, to mind the gap, because in, 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 in such a case, we will be able to start from this good starting point in order to further accelerate. Otherwise, we will lose the opportunity to, to get. This is an important point, yeah. ladies as you're in that ESG position uh, and making all those great decisions to invest in companies that are, are showing a real commitment to all aspects of ESG, you don't want the men to start crowding you out because now it's hot. Right now, it is the place to be. And so what happens, which can, which, it can happen, that the minute it becomes the central place to be, you get crowded out. So I think the women have to really like hold the ground and expand, uh, and 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 that way we can sort of shift, uh, really shift the um, conversation to uh, companies like like Znam that um, are actually doing what they need to do to attract the investments. So tell me about your future plans now that you're, you've done so much. Maybe you could also talk about this paternity leave that you have launched, because <laughs> what's wonderful about SNAM, I'm, I'm, I'm a groupie, obviously, but um, you're not waiting for compliance. It's way, you're way beyond compliance. You're getting ahead of it. So we, we st when I joined five years ago, we had about 15% women, and we had only Patrizia in the leadership team, so one out of 10. Uh, wow. Now we have 20, 25 going to 27, target of getting to 50% women, which is a real wow. challenge. I'll come back to that. An and in my leadership team, we have Patrizia running all our institutional and external affairs. We have head of HR, we have CFO, uh, head of strategy. Uh, we have Sofia, head of sustainability. 
and we have head of engineering. So we have head of six, engineering, head, head of engineering. Yeah. and so we well have about said. six, six out of eight, six out of nine, yeah. plus me, six out of ten. Wow! I think so, it's so this, I, I, you know, a lot of these people were either promoted internally or hired externally. Never was a choice made because they were women. We were simply asking the headhunters, show me the best person in Italy, outside of Italy, doing this job with this profile and they happen to be women. So this is very important. We haven't been pushing for it at the top level. We have had though to push very hard to change the balance at the middle or lower levels uh -huh. in a country where we still have too much cultural biases. Right. I'm the dad of two daughters. I grew up in uh, doing school in America, in the UK. I've always had girls being better than boys in maths. It's a fact. It's due to the way the brain is wired, the corpus calorum is performing better, girls are better at multitasking. Neuroscience now tells us for a fact that girls are better than boys at math. Fact. In Italy, only 40% of girls in, in lower school think they can get the same grade as boys. So we have a massive yes, cultural yes, bias, which is why SNAM is trying to work with schools, we're working with the government to change the school system and add more maths. And when it comes to girls in ESG and, and, and professionals in ESG, they too often approach ESG as a soft science. And mm -hmm. I keep telling uh, girls at schools and, and at university, ESG is a science. ESG is about getting carbon to zero, whether you're in ADNOC or in SNAM. And by the way, we're working very well and closely with ADNOC on some of these efforts. We're leading as SNAM the way to get hydrogen as a green fuel to replace some conventional fuel. So, ESG actually needs engineers more than philosophers of, of sustainability. Uh, and, and, and really there's this STEM gap where 80% of future jobs are STEM and we're still struggling to get enough women into STEM, at least in this country. But the point is not only we need to promote the, the women into a position where we get to ideally 50% uh, gender neutrality. In SNAM, we have a 7% premium on the gender pay gap, when you look at women, they're earning more than men in, the, in the leadership positions. <laughs> and when we, uh, though, look at maternity, they, too many women leave. And yeah. so that's where, and Sophia was behind this, we've come up with this idea of voluntarily extend uh, parental kind of male leave as well, so our, our male colleagues can be with their wives mm. uh, when, when they're having uh, a child. Uh, and the government's uh, raising the bar on that. We'll hopefully soon be able to announce even more ambitious targets. Uh, but it's, um, it's important to say that we've put ESG in our bylaws. Hmm. So this is not about a trend that will change. The board's represented here as well. We've made it mandatory for the future generations of people in SNAM to have uh, two-fifths of women in every board position that we have in the company. That's, that's fantastic. I would say that's an applause right there. Um, and, Nina, and, you're and too, I, Nina, you're no, too No, no, I mean, this is, am I correct? I understood the plus 7% premium. Yeah. Premium, on, not, not on the whole group, on the management, uh, okay. dirigenti and... Uh, okay. Marie-Bas is very interested here. Um, <laughs> well, gives you some ideas. Uh, no, yeah. but, we, but we, just, have a, we have a lot of room for improvement. Well, we all do, but here is what we're talking about is best practices, and some companies are doing more, and I hope that the investors will actually look kindly upon you because you're doing more. Sometimes if you get ahead of things, it's, it, 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 it's harder. But you're, you're getting ahead, and um, no, I But this, this is a whole point. I mean, the bottom line is we're, and I, I don't want to brag about this at all, it's a fact, the stock is among the best performing, yeah. if not the mm. best performing in exactly. the industry. So this, this concept that you're closing the gender gaps, you're paying people more, you're giving paternity leave, it all trickles down to the bottom line if you're focused on performance in the right way. Exactly. And so it pays off handsomely. Handsomely. And you've got the loyalty. Because women are that, loyal. That you're, uh, the, yeah. And, and I, I think stick. boys are quite loyal as well. But what, what I really think is the multitasking is what I'm really convinced mm. of. Yeah. It's this ability to juggle multiple things mm -hmm. at the same time. And we boys were just focused on like the so hedgehog. Biases. We can do kind of one thing so at a time. Yeah, yeah. multitasking is important because it's a matter of survival for women. Uh, we, we need, we need any, anyway, we need over, we need also to overcome some stereotypes. Yes. I, I, I do think that, okay, it's okay, it's true that maybe multitasking is easier for women, but sometimes it's something that uh, is anyway 
but you, you shouldn't ex expect women to be multitasking, yeah, exactly, is what you're saying. Exactly, because exactly. Because we're always that, that, juggling. Just, just for the record, that's why I stopped her on loyalty. I'm not sure about loyalty, oh, but no. I've studied a lot of neuroscience, so multitasking is a fact in, in, in broad, yeah. general terms. Yeah. So I, where we have a fact, it's, it's good but to use it. it fact, I think it's a fact related to education. No? I don't think it's a fact natural. I mean, I, I, uh, because it I think probably it's a really dangerous thing. The to think that women, you know, are naturally, yeah, exactly. Um, you know, multitasking all the time. Because I think if you want to get somewhere, you need to put all your energy in that. So sometimes multitasking is, is you know, is a trap. Mm -hmm. I think you need That's to prioritize. True. I think you need to work hard on what you want to get, and and you need to get help on the side. You know, I don't think that uh, we can do everything by ourselves. I think we need partners who are encouraging and supportive. I think we need to have help. I think, you know, so multitasking, I'm I'm a little skeptical about. Well, say. let's hope that the government in Italy needs a lot, do a lot of work in terms of providing the support for women to be able to work in these companies or at the Bank of Italy or any of these places. Because there's, but on the loyalty, I will send you a study because there are <laughs> studies about loyalty um, because they don't jump around. Women don't jump around if they see they see they perceive their their bosses and the structure to be supportive and. Um, and, and also recognize their skills. Um, but I'm wondering, what is the situation at ADNA? OK, so I'll share with you my own personal experience first, and then I'll tell you how, yeah. what's happening there. So when I started, I started uh, as an analyst. That was like in 2007. Mm -hmm. uh, so ever since like, we spent a, I spent a year, we first start, let's say, with uh, like a developed program or something for, let's say, new joiners. And then you start moving up the ladder, basically, or you start changing positions or something. So I had a male mentor ever since, like, not immediately at the start, but like a few years later on. And he has been mentoring me ever since until now. Oh, wow. But that mentorship did not st stop at mentorship only. I mean, it included sponsorship. It included pushing me sometimes. Because just like what, what was mentioned in the other panels as well, as a female, sometimes we doubt ourselves. I mean, I, I did have that like at some, time, at some point in my career. So I was like, okay, do I fit this? Do I have 100%, let's say, of the capability? Do I have 100% of the required background or something? But guess what? My male mentor, my male managers believed in me more than uh, how much I believed in myself. So which was like a bit, uh, if you think about it, it's like it keeps you wondering, actually. If they can't see me, let's say, better than this, or if they can't see me, more capable than this. Why would I doubt myself? Mm -hmm. That never mm -hmm. happened again. I mean, now I'm like <laughs> just like moving forward. But it does help a lot. I mean, when you see other people are like believing in you, and they are supporting you, and they are giving you actually the, the chances. Not Very just that, important. they even take you to the leadership. Mm -hmm. So I remember when His Excellency Dr. Sultan Jabber joined Adnok in 2016. So he had meetings with, let's say, the senior managers from all directors and stuff. My mentor used to be my manager at that time. And he was telling him that the, uh, about the different talents they have in the finance, about the different capabilities they have. And at that time, I had won like an international award from the Institute of Leadership and Management. And he mentioned that to him. Guess what? I was a senior analyst at that time. So his Excellency Dr. Sultan said, where is she? I want to see her. And it was like, when they called me, I was like, OK, he's the, he's the managing director of ADNOC. He's a group CEO. I'm just like a senior analyst. So I went there to the meeting room, and he was like, how are you, Nora? I was like, I'm good, thank you. And then he was like, congratulations, I'm very proud of you. And that was, guess what, my first meeting with him. <laughs> I was like, thank you, I'm honored. And then he was like, do you want to join us here? Wow. Yeah, seriously. So I was that, like, was that, that, well, yeah. that shows that So that's just like a simple example of, let's say, mm -hmm. how the ecosystem in Adnoc is built actually to support such talent, to support, let's say, the female leadership, how it is embedded within. It's like at different levels. So I mentioned that, uh, that we had like, achieved so many things at an ad -nook. So Dr. Sultan, uh, when he joined in 2016, he made a pledge to, let's say, have one female CEO at that time. Today, we have three female CEOs. He made a pledge to have 15% of the senior uh, leadership team females. Today, we have 17% of the uh, senior leadership as females. And we did not stop only at ad -nook level. So what we started to do is we started to support the ecosystem at the, let's say, at the outside ad -nook as well. So today, Adnoc was one of the first uh, companies to sponsor a program called Pathway 20. 
So this is like handled by uh, another company, and their main focus and target is actually to prepare females to be board members in publicly listed companies or privately owned companies. And there was actually a law that was this announced the by Emirates, the country. Yeah, right? that's in the okay. Emirates. There was a law that publicly traded companies should have at least one female representative at their boards. So this program, like Adnoc was the very first, let's say, to sponsor that. But today, I'm glad to see that more companies are actually sponsoring this program. This program today has more than 20 participants. Most of them have been appointed, let's say, to certain, board, uh, to certain boards as well. So this just gives you like an, an idea about how it is like, um, how should I say, it's not just like an individual initiative or something. It's not like specifically to certain company. It's actually like enhancing the entire ecosystem to support such a thing. Well, support, I mean, mentor role models are very important. Mentors are very important. The sad, the sad fact, and I'm going to see if there are any questions from the audience in, in, in a second. The sad fact is the Me, Too, the Me Too movement has been a double-edged sword. Let's just say that. Because in the United States, mentors now, male mentors, are almost afraid to meet with their mentees, uh, are afraid to go out to dinner or to, you know, do whatever, you know, they don't go golfing, but whatever they do. Um, and, and that is something that we need to be aware of and, and help fix uh, because sometimes things go too far and there's a backlash. And in the United States, there's, we're living through that backlash. Um, but is there any, are there any pressing questions from the audience? Yes, a man, yes, this is great. <laughs> Can we get a mic here? Yeah. Uh, hello. Your, your uh, name uh, and, and your yeah. affiliation. Uh, first of all, thank you very much. My name is Alexander Hoffman. I'm a journalist uh, for Class CNBC. And um, my question was speaking about sustainability and sustainable transition, as we call it. Um, we saw right now that mm, lots of girls and lots of women are embracing this kind of pathway uh, uh, with leaders of institutions such as the IMF, the European Commission, so on and so forth. Um, but then right now when it comes to energy crunch and the problem we are facing right now, right? Uh, are we confident enough that we will able, and that's a question that I will, uh, will ask to all the panelists, are we confident enough that we are able to meet the target of 2050, 2030, in terms of sustainability, um, given the fact that we are, we're going to have the COP26 in Glasgow and in, in, in a bit. And uh, uh, on a, a question for um, Mr. Alvera uh, about uh, uh, hydrogen as an effective way to uh, drive the energy transition. Um, um, in, we, we saw President Macron uh, speaking about nuclear energy as a way to boost hydrogen. Uh, is it, w w what is the role of Italy for, for hydrogen? And a question, uh, sorry for BNL. Um, we saw the stress test of the ECB uh, what, in terms of uh, sustainability. Uh, are you ready for it? Uh, What's, what's the issue? What's going to happen? Thank you very much. I'm sorry. OK, well, we have questions for everybody. Why don't we talk about the energy transition? I'll, I'll, be, I'll be very quick. So ju just a few numbers, because if we don't talk numbers, we get confused. Right. So um, hydrogen used to cost $1,000 per megawatt hour. Now it costs 100. It's going to go all the way down to 25 by the end of the decade. So 1,000, 125. Natural gas was 20 pre-COVID. Now natural gas is 90. If you add CO2 to natural gas, you have green hydrogen already today, cheaper than natural gas. As it gets to 25 in only nine years, it's going to be cheaper than coal. So that's it. Nothing else needs to be said. So the solar energy is 10. Mm -hmm. So people say, oh, hydrogen is inefficient. Sure, but if you have solar at 10, however inefficient it is, it's still going to be 25, which is a lot cheaper than oil, than gas, than coal used for, for uh, power generation. And we need to get to 25 to make it cheaper than coal to get China and India off coal. That's a pressing urgency. And we now have the Department of Energy of the United States fully backing 
this $25 commitment, so it's great news. So a lot still has to be done. COP will we'll see a lot of uh, positive and, and maybe not so positives, but the snowball effect is in motion as we get hydrogen cheaper than fossil fuels in certain parts of the world, of course, where it's sunny. And places like Abu Dhabi and Saudi Arabia, they're actually leading the way in these technologies because they're blessed with the cheapest sun, the best mm -hmm. infrastructure, the best technologies. And so that's why we're spending a lot of time in the Middle East right now. Yes, Odi. No, but I mean, I do agree with the dynamics and support, but this being said, it's not going to be easy to be at, to reach the net zero in 2050. So there is a lot of difficult decision to be made, a lot of transformation, a lot of I mean, a really tough choice, but I, it's absolutely needed. Technology will help, and uh, hydrogen will certainly help, and there are very good news on the side of technology, but it's not, I mean, this requires a lot of political leadership and tough decision, uh, and I hope, I hope that COP26 will be a first step. But when you see what, are the, what is the situation, the degree of commitment of a number of countries, I mean, there's still a lot of way to go. We need political leadership, and we need the banks and the investors and financing. to finance this transition, because you've got to follow the money. Without the money, it, we're not getting there. There's 70 so, trillion there, as you said, this, waiting There's to a be. lot, yeah. that there's <laughs> a lot of money. And the women, are, and, and, the, and this is the issue of the panel, like the women are going to help in this transition because sure. they are going to start having, they have the portfolios and they can invest the money. You, you ESG, ESG stress test, the answer is yes, we are working on it. And uh, uh, for sure to, uh, to, uh, to add to the uh, economic performance uh, some extra performance uh, KPIs will be of paramount importance. Uh, the most challenging part is uh, to get uh, a common taxonomy that is still yes. not there. Uh, because otherwise, uh, uh, benchmark uh, will not be uh, interesting enough, let's say. I, would, I wouldn't say uh, nothing more, okay? That's well, maybe I can add, you know, the uh, Banca d'Italia is part of the ECB, so we are the supervisory Italian arm of ECB, and that what we're doing exactly this, you know, we, we, can, we, we can see the banks are telling us that uh, climate change is the one risk uh, most important risk, even more than cyber attack, they're facing yeah. right now. So the work right now is on a good pace for benchmarking, so the taxonomy is going to be the key thing. And um, and I think that we, we don't have that much time to, to no, waste. We I think we are yeah. getting there. And uh, already next year, from you know data from this year, we're going to be in a better position to look at these issues. Okay, we have five minutes left, and I would like a round on the call to action. You know, this is the Women's Forum, call to action, here we go. Why don't we start <laughs> with you, Alessandra? Um, more, um, more girls into STEM, uh, more girls into programs they're going to uh, habilitate and give them the, um, you know, the chance to uh, become, um, you know, uh, coders, engineers, so that they can have an active role in this revolution that we're facing in all industries with the application of technology to, to services and to production. Uh, I would say a bit of a bit uh, a bit more of courage. Courage. Yeah. Courage. Ladies, you yes. heard it here. Yeah. I would like uh, really to, to, to push. Uh, we need to dare a bit more. And courage for me, uh, I like the definition by Hemingway. Is grace under pressure. And we need really to put a bit of grace, uh, even if uh, uh, these are time of uh, a bit of pressure. But uh, really, uh, I would like to see more women uh, daring, uh, because this is something uh, we, uh, we we really need. I think dare to dare. dare to yeah, dare. <laughs> dare to dare. Um, I heard yesterday that you were saying that the commitments, the CEO commitments. Uh, were not enough, and so I was just wondering what, um, what what you would up, what more would you like to see CEOs commit to? I, I wasn't specifically referring to that. I said that sometimes <laughs> when we get too many people around the table, mm -hmm. then we tend to want to get a consensus, and then right. we dilute well, down the ambition, yeah. and we don't dare. So I totally subscribe to the point 
uh, Asana was raising about uh, more women in STEM, especially here in Italy. I think in the US and the UK, where I, I spend a lot of time, it's more women in absolute leadership roles. I think there's a great percentage of women in mid-management, but there's still very few CEO right. uh, women. Um, I think when it comes to uh, being uh, bolder, I really think there's so much more that companies can and should do. And there's kind of, they're kind of stuck in inertia. And that's why in Italy we got 100, um, well, we got 100 companies to work together to change a school system, to have a liceo, to have a high school uh, with, more, uh, with more coding and more mm -hmm. STEM and inevitably more gender balance. But with 35 companies in Valore di, we're working on Which a, he founded. I know. Mm -hmm. We're working on a, on, a, on a real kind of more ambitious mm -hmm. pack that can really create, kind of break the ice and create leadership. So as, as I think about the call to action, I think companies, because of ESG, because of the, all the things we've been discussing, can, will, and should even be allowed to do a lot more uh, on society because uh, after COVID, companies have gained a lot of trust. And if they step up to that responsibility, they can do a lot more. And it's true for banks, for, for corporates, and, and for organizations. Yeah. Noah? So uh, as a company, we are committed to continue paving the way for future female talents. As me personally, I'll continue actually giving back whatever. I was lucky, I mean, to have people support me, uh, supporting me. So I'll continue supporting female talents and male talents as well. But not just at the company level, at the society level as well. And I've already started uh, engaging with a social enterprise where I'm doing it on a voluntary basis. So I hope I'll continue that as well as at home because I'm an elder sister of all sisters, actually. So. Uh, we, it all begins at home. Yeah. So it's very important. <laughs> and you're a role model to everybody. Odin. No, my message to government would be not to hesitate to take regulatory measures because I think bottom up and, and um, mm -hmm. um, voluntary action is fine. But for example, in France, we have the experience of quotas. And personally, I was not in favor of quota in principle, but we have experience in quota in board, and it has been proven very effective mm -hmm. to create yeah. sufficiently dynamism, to create a, a network of women and so forth. So I think that should always be considered in order to create really a big push to move forward in terms of representation, okay. of also, I mean, giving confidence to women that they can be the, that, that can be their role also, and so forth. So I think that should always be on the table also. Yes, no, absolutely. Regulations to help, and also for companies' procurement, you know? I mean, all those contracts, the legal contracts you should have, you should be getting suppliers that are either women-owned companies or companies that have a high percentage of women. So all banks, companies, everyone can do their part. And I think all of you are uh, examples of um, how you can really uh, change the world. I personally think that uh, millennials are, are very much moving into that direction. Any of you who have children are listening to the way they're looking at the world. We messed it up pretty much. Um, and now uh, our children have to find a way, whether working through companies, through uh, government, uh, through financial institutions, um, or in, as investors, and that's a way they can start right away as soon as they get some of the money, to really invest their values and invest into the future that they are envisioning. And that future has to take into account climate change, mitigation, adaptation, because it's late, folks. And of course, the gender equality and diversity uh, uh, that we need to have these companies thrive in this new world. So I'd like to thank you all. I want to thank, again, Chiara Veramente. You've put together an incredible uh, few days. All the speakers were you know, phenomenal. This panel was phenomenal. And I want to say a special thank you to our wonderful Matt. male CEO <laughs> who has survived this. Brava Chiara. Una foto. Una bella foto qui insieme, dai. Una bella foto.
Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.